was last seen on this surveillance video riding her bicycle home from a friend's house. Several vehicles were also observed in the same video and broadcast to the public as vehicles of interest. All of the vehicles were interest, of interest were ruled out except for a white Chevrolet Z71. Hello and welcome to the True Crime Edition. We want to send out our prayers for Mickey Schumacher's family and friends who have suffered the brutal loss of their loved one. The case of Michaela Schunick, also known as Mickey. Today we go over to the state of Louisiana. When it comes to Louisiana, this place is known for being a diverse state and also the culture. There's many people that live there, African American, French, German, Irish, Latino. With all of this great influence, it does have on the food industry, also festivals, art culture and everything else you can think of. This town of Lafayette lies deep in the south coast line and is founded was in 1920. At this time the population had 498 souls. It also has a huge heart when it comes to ones that live there. Lafayette was named the happiest city in America. The LGBT population have described it as welcoming. It does operate Central for Oil in 1940, also natural gas industries in 2018. It has kept up with the modern things like aerospace and many banks along as well as retail stores. The Lafayette University campus would not exist without any of this. Now this quaint little town with its university, it has made an impact to Lafayette of $11 billion economy. As a result of its growth, the city and region have become major centers for the technology industry. Now, Mickey Schunick was a 21-year-old and she was born on May 21st, 1990. Now, her friends and family have called her Mickey. She was one of the ones that was attending the university study in anthropology. She was a senior. Her home was with the four miles from the university, and she has always preferred to ride her bike to it. She was living with her family, and she was the daughter of Tom Schunick and Nancy Rowe. She was very close to her family. She had, did have a younger brother named Zach, and a sister named Charlene, Charlie. She was a beautiful, caring soul. Mickey loved teaching and loved animals. She was a teacher in horseback riding lessons to children. She was an avid cyclist and would go out and ride her bike even though she did own a car. She always preferred to ride her bike instead. She was an outdoorsy type of person. She had a great sense of humor, always making people laugh. There was never a dull moment. She was always doing something fun. She always was making every moment count in her life. Living there in Lafayette her whole life, she had a group of best friends that she would hang out, and she had known them ever since kindergarten. On May 18, 2012, summer was right around the corner and she was getting ready to the end of her studies at the university. After this, she would forge ahead as a qualified adult, and her family was proud of her. Now, Mickey had made plans with her group of friends to go out of the evening. Now, before she left, 
She did promise that she, her mother that she would be back early, due the next day was an important one for her and her younger brother, Zach. It would be a graduation from his high school, and she did not want to miss it for the world. Also, in a few days after that, Mickey would be celebrating her 22nd birthday on May 21st. The family had made big plans to celebrate it. It was on Friday, May 18th, Mickey had went out with her friends the evening. She had stayed with her friends for a bit, but then her and Brentley had went on their own from the rest of the group. They went and grabbed a couple drinks at the Atmosphere Bar. Then later, they had went to a local Taco Bell drive through and to get some food. Then they went back to Brentley's house on Ryan Street. Mickey and Brentley had just hung out for about two hours and Mickey wanted to head back home due to it was her brother's graduation and she needed to get some rest. Brentley's home was only four miles down the road to Mickey's home. She had went there many times on her bike and she never had any issues in the past so she just opted to ride her bike instead of calling a taxi. It was about 1.45 in the morning on Saturday on the 19th she had left Brentley's home and went south down on the street of Congress. After that she vanished. As the sun would rise on May 19th of 2012, you could hear the birds singing. It was going to be an exciting day for the whole family. Mickey's mom, Nancy, thought everyone was getting ready for the big day for Zach's graduation. Nancy wanted to make sure that Mickey was getting ready also. As her mother went into her room to see her, as she went in there, there was no one around. It was just an empty bed, not slept in. Her mother got a pit in her stomach and she knew that Mickey would call or come home. This was not like her at all. Now the family already made plan to go to the graduation and Nancy had texted Mickey to tell her to meet them there at the ceremony. In hopes thinking that maybe Mickey might have spent the night at her friend's house instead of just coming home. However, Mickey did not show up for Zach's graduation, that this was out of character for her, and she was a very responsible person, and the family knew that she would not miss it for the world. As they arrived home after the ceremony, the parents of Mickey and their fears turned into full panic mode as they got into the house and she was not even there. Her bike wasn't there. There was no sign of her. They had called her, and it went right to voicemail. Then they text her many times, also no word at all. They had waited in hopes that she would text or call back with no word. It was a while. She had been missing now for a full day and still no word from her. So Nancy had called at 5 p.m. She did call the police to report her daughter missing, was on the case the investigator had to find out where she was and where she went that night. They did not take this lightly. The first thing they did was to interview the last person that saw her alive, which was Brentley. The investigators had asked him to come in to be interviewed. He was nervous, but he did tell them everything that it would happen that night, and then she left on her bike. Ricky uh, took off towards uh, my house and uh, I offered to get her food at a nearby Taco Bell. Brought her back, um, she ate it. At that point, um, we got two phone calls from friends asking you know, where we were, um, checking in us and saying that they were gonna go get food somewhere else. But at that point, Mickey decided she was still too tired. She had gotten food and so she had wanted to go home at that point. She had gone out the night before. Um, she didn't have anything to drink to my knowledge. Um, she seemed pretty exhausted, a little nauseous from the night before. So. Um, I didn't see her drink anything. I don't think she drank anything. Mickey's done this, you know, every night we've ever gone out that she's ridden her bike somewhere. She actually rode her bike to the show, which is a bit further than my house. Um, it was nothing out of the ordinary for her to bike anywhere, um, no matter the time of day. As for the next day, the morning arose and Mickey was still nowhere to be found and the word did spread of her missing in the community. It had came involved into 
finding her. As well as they got flyers and posters to hand out, they did everything to help and support the family. The community got together. They did search the surrounding areas also with no luck. The investigators had to wait for Monday to retrieve the footage. After he had got the CCT footage on Monday, the bar and the footage from Taco Bell, they did confirm what Brentley was saying was true and that he was not involved. The investigators said that the main thing is to see what route that she had to have taken and the route that she went home on. But the sad irony is this would be Mickey's 22nd birthday. The town did hold a vigil to pray for her safe return and to help the family in this time of need. The family and friends of Mickey had made a public plea saying that they will pay up to $25,000 for any information that would help them lead to find Mickey. We have been reviewing hours and hours of video and, and, and part of the biggest issue is that a lot of the video is either coming from inside of a building facing out so it's very grainy or very difficult to look at or we just can't make out exactly what's passing in front of the camera. So it's so important that, you know, unfortunately, you know, we may have missed some, some people that have surveillance equipment that they review their own equipment for us. And, and if they see something of importance that they contact the police, either by calling 911 or calling the tips line at 291-863. We still just need more volunteers and people talking about it. People who can't get out there and walk, you know, we understand not everybody is able to go on mile-long searches and things like that. If they want to come here and see if there's anything they can do to help, or at least just get online and email everyone. Many members of the community had also and some businesses to return some footage that they have from the cameras to the police, just in hopes that maybe they could find her in it. It was several days of the police watching all the footage that was handed in, and finally they caught a break. They saw Mickey on her bike going home at 1.45 in the morning. As they watched the footage on her going on her bike, about a half a mile down the road, she was spotted behind a white pickup truck that was ahead of her. She had went out of the sight of the camera. Knowing the route now that she had taken, they followed it and got more video images of her going by a gas station just a few minutes later, riding her bike on St. Laundry, still heading toward home. After this, she was not seen again. With nothing to go on, officers were at a loss due to all the other cameras were just monitoring traffic. Mickey was only spotted on two of the cameras. The officers were going over the footage and did notice something that was pretty odd and interesting. Mickey was passing the gas station on Ryan Street. The pickup was nowhere in the footage until Several seconds later, it can be seen coming, turning right on Ryan Street, now heading in the same direction right behind Mickey as she was riding her bike. Then, the same white truck can be captured about two minutes later, coming back the opposite direction. The police were still no closer of knowing who owns the white truck, due to the cameras did not have high enough resolution to capture the license plate number or who was driving it. She was last seen on this surveillance video riding her bicycle home from a friend's house. Several vehicles were also observed in the same video and broadcast to the public as vehicles of interest. All of the vehicles were interest, of interest were ruled out except for a white Chevrolet Z71 pickup. This Chevrolet pickup is a popular in Louisiana. There are close to about 2,000 to 3,000 of them, and that's not including the surrounding areas. So the police and the investigators were not even sure if this pickup really had any involvement into Mickey's disappearance. They would have to wait for new clues or leads or tips coming in. There are many who in the community were looking everywhere for a clue to Mickey's disappearance. Everyone had come up empty and nothing. On May 27th, almost eight days after Mickey wound up missing and 25 miles from where she was actually last seen on CCTV Alive, there were fishermen at Whiskey Bay River that had come upon 
a discovery that was significant, and they found it beneath the bridge on Interstate 10. They had saw a dark, heavy metallic object in the river. They knew it was not supposed to be there, so they had pulled it out and put it on their boat. As they were looking at the bike, it did fit the description of Mickey's bike that was in the news. They had called the police, and the investigator arrived, and when inspecting the bike, they had noticed some significant damage to the back tire, looking like someone had rammed the back of the bike. If they did confirm this was Mickey's bike, this would mean that she might have been hit by a car and the damage was from behind. The investigators was fearing the worst, that if her bike was in the swamp, then her body might be in the swampy river also. They had searched the area and all they could find was no clues. There was no luck at all in sight. The family of Mickey were still hopeful that she was still alive. Now, a few days after finding the bike, a call would come in to the police department that they knew somebody that they knew. And they said his demeanor was nervous, paranoid, and agitated over the period of a disappearance of Mickey. They also found out the same person had went missing over the same weekend as Mickey had disappeared. Then he had returned home with multiple stab wounds across the body. The man's name was 33-year-old Brandon Scott Laverne. He had served in the military for three years. He was a native to Louisiana, and he had graduated in 1998. He had led a job at the oil rig mechanic working offshore. This tip did come in from no other than Brandon's soon-to-be father-in-law. He became suspicious when he said that he had went to New Orleans, but he had been stabbed during a mugging, and his story did not make any sense. From what the father-in-law said, that he could not see any connection to anyone he knew in New Orleans, and this did not sit well with him, and he called the police. Wasn't long after the tip had come in, another one would come in. From a local car lot dealership, they had told the police that Brandon had come into the office just after the weekend that Mickey disappeared. He wanted to get a new white pickup truck, the same one that he had owned. Unfortunately, this truck was um, owned and it had been stolen a few days prior, and he wanted to get the same make and model of the truck. As they were in the office, the news had come on the TV about the missing girl, Mickey. He was right underneath the TV watching it, and her face had been shown. The salesman did take notice on how Brandon had become agitated and nervous when he saw it. The investigators had started to be concerned about Brandon, so they wanted to look into him, and in checking in his background, they were red flags. He was convicted in the year of 2000 of being a sex offender, and this would be a class three, and it's the highest classification that was given. He had served eight years in prison on the charges of sexual battery and burglary. They also found out that he was an addicted to using an escort services, even though he was engaged, and also he had many girlfriends across the state. The police had went over the gas station to where Brandon had said that he had got mugged. And in talking to the gas station owner about Brandon being mugged, he had said that there was no mugging. So the police found out that this was not true at all, that he was never there. Then they went to investigate Brandon's story of his truck being stolen. He had said that his truck was stolen while he was in Texas visiting. So the detective had contacted the Texas Police Department office to find out his story about the truck. And to their surprise, they were told that his truck had been found. The white Chevrolet Z71 pickup truck, it was in the field and burned beyond recognition. The fire was so hot that it incinerated everything except the license plate. It was still legible. And even though they could not take any DNA from the truck and link it to Mickey's disappearance, they could identify it to be the same pickup truck. Due to the surveillance cameras that they had checked to see, they could locate the truck in them. And what the police had found had ramped up the investigation. 
was around 5.15 p.m. was the same evening that Mickey had disappeared. Brandon's truck was spotted on camera in the local area. It had recorded the license plate. It also had got the contents in the back of the bed of his truck. It had revealed a 4x4 post and shows a cooler box. In the investigators, they had went back to the CCT footage and compared it to the footage captured at 515 earlier that same day. It had had the same 4x4 post and the same cooler box. Now, with all the evidence they had collected, they did feel confident that they could prove that Brandon was involved in Mickey's disappearance. The investigators knew the risk when not having a body nor finding where Mickey is if they should arrest him, but they did feel they had to do something. It was on July 5th of 2012, just 17 days after Mickey had been missing. A warrant was for his arrest had been issued. While during a traffic stop, they found out that he did not register as a sex offender that was back in 2000. His fiance did not even know what kind of a man that she was even marrying. They arrested him and took him in. They did not waste no time to ask him about Mickey's disappearance or if he knew anything about it and that he had refused to answer any questions and he had asked for his attorney. He had been charged with aggravated kidnapping and first degree murder. The investigators knew that without a body, this was going to be tough and they'd have to rely on circumstantial evidence. Also today, after weeks of searching for a missing Lafayette College student, police have made a break in the case. Lafayette police say a tip from a concerned citizen helped lead to an arrest in the Mickey Shunick case. Shunick has been missing since May, and now a man is in custody for her murder. Police have arrested 33-year-old Brandon Laverne on charges of kidnapping and first-degree murder. Then, a month later, on August 7, 2012, there was a call made and there was a human remains found, and it was buried off the roadway beyond a cemetery. The body was found off a nearby unpaved road in a parish. Her body was found in a small cemetery. She was laying right next to her jewelry and clothing. Station is reporting that police have discovered human remains and the report indicates the body may be that of Mickey Shunick. The 21-year-old disappeared from Lafayette back in May. Now officials in that community have not made any statements about this discovery, but KLFY is reporting a body was found today in Evangeline Parish and police are on scene at an undisclosed location conducting a search that is related to the shooting case. Back in July, police arrested 33-year-old Brandon Scott Laverne and charged him with Shunick's murder, even though body had yet to be found. He has pleaded not guilty to the charges. More information on that as it comes into our newsroom. After the finding of Mickey's body and knowing she will not come home alive, but relief and all the same knowing what had happened to her and bringing her home, the autopsy said that she had been stabbed multiple times with a final gunshot to her head, killed her instantly. Now, the police had to do is connect Brandon to the murder of Mickey. The investigators knew it would be difficult, so they had went to the family of Mickey's to see if they'd wanted to strike a deal with Brandon. With the state of Louisiana having the death penalty, and Brandon's life would be on the line if he had went to court, Brandon was afraid of that. The family said yes, and the officers had went in and offered the plea deal to Brandon, and that he would confess to murdering Mickey, and then they would take the death penalty off the table. Brandon had agreed to the deal, and he had told them the horrific and gruesome details regarding the early morning hours of May 19th of 2012 and what had transpired with him and Mickey. Now this case is one for the records, guys, here on True Crime Edition. I have never come across a victim to fight back as much as Mickey has on this case. He said he was driving and had encountered Mickey on her bike. Then he stalked her, knowing that she was his next victim. 
He then intentionally had hit her and knocked her off her bike, knocking her down on the ground. He then had a knife and a semi-automatic handgun. He told her to get into the truck, and then he put her bike in the back. When in the truck, she had grabbed her phone to call 911 for help, and he told her not to. Uh, you know, when I looked up, you know, she was right there in my grill, and I, I, I slammed my brakes and I hit it. And I was, I was worried because I, had, I was draining and stuff, I was convicted of felling, and, and I had a gun in the truck. And I was like, man, I said, uh, you know, I wasn't worried about so much her hitting her, I was worried more about, you know, getting caught with that gun, you know. We start arguing back and forth, and I started getting mad. And I guess that's when she kind of, I guess she started getting spooked. And she reached down to grab the, uh, the phone. And I, and I just, I panicked, and, I, and I, that's when I grabbed the knife. And I said, don't call the cops. I said, I ain't playing with you, just to put it on the phone. Then he said that Mickey had sprayed him in the face with mace that she had with her. He then had wrestled it from Mickey. And as he did, she had grabbed the knife away from him and stabbed him with it several times. And later, it would be called life-threatening wounds. As he tried to grab the knife away from Mickey, it caused him to cut tendons in his hands. He had then stabbed Mickey four times, and then she fell over. She was laid lifeless. And she just kind of started, she's like staring at me. I started stabbing her. And I'm, I'm trying to stab her, I'm guessing maybe four or five times, and I caught myself, and I was like, I said, what the, God, I was like, man, what the f*** just happened? He said he took her to a nearby cane field, north in Akeda Parish, more than a half an hour away to dump her body off. When he had stopped the truck, it was at this moment that Mickey had regained consciousness. She had then grabbed the knife again and stabbed him in the chest with it. She popped up and stabbed me dead in my chest. I hollered out and I, I, I shot. I, I shot one time you know, with the gun. I jumped out of the truck and I was hollering. He then drove home to St. Laundry Parish with Mickey's body in the passenger seat, knowing all the time now that she is dead. He went into his house to nurse his wounds. He said, then he got rid of the bloody clothing. He cleaned out his truck. He drove Mickey to a secluded Evangeline Parish Cemetery and dumped her off her body. With the wounds that he had suffered from Mickey, he could not bury Mickey's body, so he covered some branches and debris. The next day, he headed to New Orleans, and on his way there, he went out and dumped the bike at Whiskey Bay River. As he was there in New Orleans, he had went to get his wounds treated at Ashna Medical Center. Then he got rid of the weapons in New Orleans, the ones that he used to attack Mickey. Then on Sunday, he had returned to the old cemetery to finish burying Mickey's body, and this is where she would be for the next 80 days. The detectives had seen clearly from the injuries that Brandon had that Mickey had fought for her life, and she fought hard. As her mother had said in a statement, she was her mighty Mickey. Then the case would take an awful turn for the worst and a twist in this shocking news. When Brandon had pleaded guilty, he was not just of Mickey, but another woman also from Lafayette, and he had killed her too. He had confessed to the murder. Lisa Pate, a mother of three, she had gone missing in June of 1999. He had convinced her to go out of town with him, and in the middle of going, she changed her mind. She had wanted to go back to see her kids. He had refused. Then later, as he was sleeping in the hotel room, she tried to sneak out with his car keys and wallet, but he had woken up, and a fight ensued. He had confessed a couple inmates of how he had killed Lisa. He told them that he had killed her by placing a bag over her head and suffocated her to death. Then he put Lisa's body near a friend's house out back trying to redirect suspicion off of him. Her body was found in September of 1999 in a church point area under some wooden floorboards. There were new renters and they found her remains. He was convicted of two life sentences without possibility of parole. 
He is now serving hard time in the state penitentiary of Louisiana in Angola, Louisiana. He is in solitary confinement. He did file many appeals, but they all been denied. And he will likely spend the rest of his life in prison. In 2015, there was a bike loop, and it was named Mickey's Loop. It was built and di directed in her memory. It was an eight-mile route that takes people through the city of the town that Mickey loved so much, Lafayette. This beautiful tribute for Mickey's memory. The city parish president, Joel Newell, said, This really highlights what she loved, and we're proud to honor her with this. I am sure her family is so proud of her. I know I would be if she was my daughter. Mickey was really an inspiration. She had fought for her life and she did not give up. She literally made her mark on the murder to catch him. She had fought back with all that she had and she did a great job, in my opinion, of making sure that they found the one who did this to her. Thank you so much for joining me today. You guys have a great day.